That's fabulous. So thank you, everybody. Welcome to today's meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. I want to start by saying a special welcome to um, Farah, who's joined us from the Board of Trustees. Thank you. And to Pam Rooney, who's joined us from the Town Council. We're thrilled to have you both um, joining us. So thank you for that. So I'm just going to ask you uh, to signify your presence verbally so we'll make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. Sharon. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Thank you. Alex Lefebvre. Here. Uh, Christine. Here. Uh, Alex. I assume you mean Tim Alex, or do you mean Alex? No, I meant Alex, mm -hmm. Alex. I meant you, oh, Alex. Yes, sorry. I thought <laughs> you were still taking a roll call. I already said here. Yes. Paul Bockelman. Present. Thank you. George. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Thank you. And um, I'm I'm Austin Sarah. Okay. Pardon me. Oh, Farah, I'm sorry. Having I'm here. Having welcomed you, I then ignored you. Yeah, that's okay. Are you here? Good. Thank you. Okay. So the first item of business is the approval of minutes from January, January 4th, 2024. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. A corrections to the minutes. Okay. Uh, Voting to approve the minutes. Sharon? Yes. Pam Rooney? Abstain. Thank you. Tara? Yes. Uh, Christine? Yes. Alex Lefebvre? Abstain. Uh, Paul Bachman? Yes. George Hicks? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I also want to note the presence of Tim Alex from Colliers and our good colleague, um, Bob Parent. Thank you both for being here. Okay, the next item is uh, an update from the town manager, town manager, Paul Bachman. You're muted, Paul. Is this where you want to talk about the bids or is it a different item on the agenda? I don't have the agenda. I think, for me. I think we should talk about the bids. Okay, let's, bid. Let's, okay. Let's, uh, let's, yeah. Okay. Uh, so as people know, on uh, April, whatever date is Friday at 2 p.m., we opened bids. It turns out we received one bid to do the general con contracting for the Jones Library. That bid, when it revealed, was about $7 million over the expected amount that was projected earlier. Um, and so at the, after that, uh, that was a sort of a pretty dramatic um, awakening. And so since that time, we've been talking about what does that mean? Look, what's what's in that bid? What does, <laughs> how does it, how do we, what are the options available to the town given that, that the bid number? Um, so, I guess I'll just stop there for a moment. Let's see what folks. Any any questions for the town manager? Oh, I just wanted to mention, if I may, um, so, uh, the, I have until June 10th to accept or reject the bid. And uh, we are proceeding to uh, analyze the bid to try to understand as much as we can understand about uh, why that bid came in where it came in. Um, it is my understanding that the 75% estimate, which we received, was premised upon the idea that we would get five bids. We didn't know that we would get five, but that was what the expectation was that underlined that 75% uh, um, estimate. So we don't yet know exactly why the bid came in where it came in. And we've got to try to figure that out. And that will involve conversations with um, the architects, our OPM, 
uh, in an effort to try to understand as much as we can understand about um, ab about the bid. Any questions about that, Paul? Yeah, so um, with this bid, I think that's we have a number of options that I think we want to put on the table. I don't think this is we're we're not we're in no position and have enough intelligence to make a, an informed decision at this point. So one is to um, accept the bid, except we can't sign a contract because we don't have enough money to meet the bid requirements. That would mean additional appropriation from the town or additional funds from someplace else. So that's option one. The second option we have is to simply rebid it. When you have one bid, that's substantially over the the expected bid number. Um, uh, we're allowed to go out and do it again. You know, send it out, reject the bid, and go out and with the same documentation and hope that someone else will bid. Third option um, would be to say, you know, in, uh, again, determining what happens with our the information that we gather from bidders who bid and bidders who did not bid um, is say, maybe the market conditions weren't appropriate at this moment in time, sort of hit the pause button and come September, send out the exact same bid in the hope of getting more bidders feeling if, if, if the analysis supports the logic that it was the lack of number of bidders that drove the price to where it was. A third or a fourth option would be to go back to the project, examine the drivers of the higher bid, look at the things that we we can ascertain from the bidders why, why it was higher. Are there changes that could be made to the design or the uh, requests in the bid? make adjustments to that and then rebid. Um, and the last option is to say, the bid came in too high, we don't have enough funds, we will now terminate this project. Great, thanks. Pam Rooney, you had your hand up before, I'm sorry. Um, the, yes, I did and I was going to ask if there is latitude to negotiate with the one bidder. Um, no, this is a, a a bid process, and Bob, you might want to jump in. You either accept or you reject the bid. Am I right on that, Bob? Uh, you're correct. You need to have the appropriation in hand to be able to execute the contract. Um, there's always an opportunity to make some change orders after the fact, but change orders of this significance would likely be called into question by the AG's office as circumventing the, the bidding process. Thanks, Bob. Pam, did that – was that – what you want? Okay, thanks. So, any other questions for the for the town manager about where we are? And again, I just want to emphasize, Paul, the, a decision needs to be made by the tenth of June. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a conversation by the library board of trustees uh, to inform the trustees about where we are um, in this um, in this process, and. Uh, my hope and expectation is that a recommendation will be made to the town manager uh, in advance of the decision that the town manager has to make uh, by the tenth of uh, by the tenth of June. Uh, I'm going to call on Alex and then uh, Pam. Are you back in? Okay, okay. Alex and then Pam. Alex. Thanks. So I guess I just want to understand. Um, sort of what I mean, I've, <coughs> I've I've read the charge of this committee. But uh, I'm, so I'm not really sure what the expectations are of this committee relative to that process. And so I, I guess I want to understand what our role is and how, how we should be proceeding to fulfill whatever our charge or role is relative to what's occurred. So from my perspective, I mean, ultimately, it is the town manager's decision, but the Jones Library Building Committee is an important um, this this group. Most people in this group have been involved in this project for, from a lot of time. And I think when we talk about options in terms of, especially if we're going to um, make changes to the design, if that's even permissible, um, then uh, this committee has always been involved in the design decisions of the building. In terms of um, additional funding, that would have to be a decision that would, you know, we would have to seek additional funding that would come from the town council. Um, if there is going to be additional borrowing authorization, and if there's, if it's simply a strategy of rebidding, you know, 
you know, rejecting the bid and rebidding. And as long as we look at what the implications of that, the financial implications of that, um, which we are starting to, we, you know, we're digging into that a little bit more. Um, uh, th that could be just a, an administrative decision by the manager. So Alex, uh, Pam, before you get in, um, my hope is that when we have a little more information, depending on what that information is, we would reconvene the building committee um, and just share where we where we are and what we know. At this point, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, Pam? Thank you. Um, Paul mentioned something about understanding what the drivers were for some of the overages in this bid. And it has been my knowledge all along that um, MBLC was not open to changing scope or changing changing much in the project once it was locked in back in schematic design. Has anyone approached MBLC to ask about this kind of scenario where you're faced with such an overage? And what yes. is what is what is their response? So as I understand from MBLC, MBLC is very interested in uh, seeing this project succeed, but MBLC is so far uh, unwilling to uh, kind of go back to the drawing board and redesign the project. So in terms of the program and the square footage, uh, I think from MBLC's point of view, those are, those are givens. Um, and to the best of my knowledge so far, uh, MBLC has been pretty clear that uh, they would not uh, want to go forward if we were to say, let's cut off so many square footage or let's change the program in any significant in any significant way. Sharon, do you share that understanding? Yes, sorry. Yes, um, we I, I spoke with the MBLC. Uh, um, the architects have spoken with the MBLC. Um, Mindy and Joe have spoken with the MBLC, um, and and they've been very clear about all of that. And this was at a point where they understood the the extremity of of the bid. Yeah, it's um. So the MBLC, the, this grant program is not, it's not in place for, um, you, you know, building maintenance, building repairs, that kind of a thing. It's meant to go hand in hand with with um, the town's local decisions and, and town funding in order to create a library space and services uh, that will last the next 30, 40, 50 years. And if we cut square footage, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't be the right use of, of tax dollars, statewide tax dollars. Pam, it's a very good question. And I think the, the clearest thing that we can say is the answer from MBLC is no on changing the program or reducing the square footage. Christine. Um, I guess this is sort of to Paul, um, so there's a 20% shortage or an increase in the price and you have till June 10th. Do you need to establish where that extra money would come from by then? Meaning we're already, there's not <laughs> much time. Would, would you have to go to town council? Do you have to look at your internal funds? Like, what would be the process? Like, are you sort of looking at all of these five options and trying to do due diligence for each thing? So I'm wondering about the one where there's a shortage of money. Right. Um, yeah, so we are looking at, at all of those options. I think the first thing we need to do is everybody says, why is it so much higher? We don't know the answer to that. And that's, you know, our OPM is having conversations with the actual bidder and also the people who didn't bid to understand what were the market conditions or what were the pieces of the project that drove these prices up? Because, I mean, one option is just to say, okay, it's $7 million more. Let's put $7 million more. I'm not seeing where the source of those $7 million is. Um, you know, it, it, I haven't, no one has stepped up 
no, no one from the council or uh, private sector have said, "Hey, I got you. I got. You. I can. We can cover that." Um, so at this point, I'm not looking that at that as the first option. It, but it might be a situation where we have multiple solutions. You know, we have we have this and that and the other thing. Um, so all it, it's an early meeting in terms of how we're putting this together. And it's going to be a lot of people who are going to have to make decisions along the way, I think, uh, before we get there. If we're going to accept this bid, right? That's the that's the operating principle. And the, and the thing about the bid that we want to mention is that it's a good, people say it's a good company. At least all the experts in the field say, if you're going to work with a company, it's a solid company to work with. Great. Thank you, Paul. Christine? Uh, you're muted, Christine follow-up question that, um, you know, we're a group here, but what what kind of input, like what is the OPM and FAA giving <laughs> any advice or suggestions on this? What is their counsel right now? Uh, Tim, do you want to say something on behalf of the OPM? Ellen, do you want to say something on behalf of FAA? Sure. Um... So we were surprised by the, the fact that um, the numbers came in so far from the estimates. Um, the filed sub bids came in pretty much on target. And that's not always an indicator of where the general contractor is going to come in. Uh, but we've started those conversations to try and find out where, why the numbers came in where they did. Um, certainly, there are some scopes of work that um, they see as drivers of, of cost. Um, you know, estimators, uh, we rely on them quite a bit to give us the, the market conditions across the Commonwealth, or at least try and get as, as close to um, our market as we can. Um, but sometimes there are parts of projects or, um, you know, every project's a little different and there's something that, um, that they may not have picked up on. You know, this is a, a tight site you can't go in there with big equipment. You don't have um, storage space. So we're looking at all those types of things to find out really um, what those drivers are. And I think I would uh, agree with with Paul that we have to take a look at really what are our options and develop those a little bit. And typically our strategy would be to take a look at things that um, can be either supplemented to the project or cut from equipment or something that can be bought out of operating capital um, over the years. Um, something maybe outside landscaping or or something that doesn't impact the program um, of the building and, and the use of the building. Um, and that's where we would start um, if we were looking to make some adjustments to, um, to the plans as bid. Um, next step is obviously to try and reduce uh, the cost of the building itself, whether that be the finishes or uh, features of the building. Um, and lastly, and it sounds like with the MBLC grant, it's not really possible, but square footage and program. But those are kind of the strategy and steps that we would typically try and take when a project comes in uh, over our estimated uh, costs or over our budget. Thank you, Tim. Ellen, do you want to say anything? Sure. Uh, Christine, so we're we were surprised by this $7 million um, just because the file subgoods came in in line. But after chatting with the Fontaine, who was the only bidder, it confirmed what our discussions with our estimators. It was not, they maybe got one or two bids per trade and they like to get five or 10. So, and it's partly, it's many things, right? It could be that this product is tricky. so. The contractors, the subcontractors need to have their A team. The A team might not have been available, so they didn't want to pursue it. They could have, one group we talked to, they would hit their bonding cap, so they couldn't compete. So I, I think evaluating, rebidding it at another time, maybe it's in the fall, will that help us to get more bids? Hopefully, and then there's more contact with the um, contract, potential contractors to, to keep them interested in the project. Thank you. I, I might add though, uh, Alan, just on top of that, we have a selected pool. So we went through a pre-qualification process 
And um, as part of Mass General Law, we're required to um, go through that pre-qualification process and we identify all the potential bidders for filed sub bids and for general contract bids. So that's our bid pool. Um, if we were to rebid that, we would use the same bid pool unless we made significant changes and we decided to go through that pre-qualification process and try and get uh, additional contractors above and beyond what we currently have. Okay, Alex. So um, just following up on Christine's initial question, comment, it seems like there's a really tight timeline to gather a lot of information and to make decisions. And it sounds like potentially this group is gonna be providing feedback. I assume the trustees are gonna be providing feedback. So is there a timeline in terms of uh, when we expect to have the information and then start talking about next steps? Paul? Um, yeah, so I think we had talked about, it, we had talked a little bit about when this committee can meet next. They have a more substantive conversation. I forget exactly what we were talking about the week of the 20th or 27th, something around there, I think, um, to set up a meeting of this group. Uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks. I think we're already on the 7th. So I think we're going to need a couple of weeks to connect with everybody, um, uh, exa examine the different, you know, we, you just heard tonight, you know, the, the number of different things that have come to the fore that people have heard anecdotally from different bidders or potential bidders. Um, so we have to see what's the scale of that. Does that make any difference or not? Is it big enough? It's a big number. $7 million is a big number. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, and that's why I was saying it, it might be something where we, we, it's, it's multiple strategies. Um, you know, the, the operation, my operating principle is that the town has voted for this and every body, every elected body in the town has voted for this. And so we, our job is to see if we can get this project across the finish line. However, we have to do it within the financial means of the town and the council from the town's point of view has said 15.8 million is there what the con contribution the council has been willing to put into it. So there's that number hanging out there. We can lower that number or increase the money coming into it. And um, we have a very limited uh, tool set to be able to address these things. Uh, Farah? Um, I was just wondering uh, if we have a deadline with the MBLC for June, right? Was that the what was what you mentioned earlier? Yep. Then how, are we trying to get an extension from them? Like, how do we go? How do we go out to bid again in the fall? Like, is there a conversation ongoing with the MBLC about this? Mm -hmm. So with every strategy, we'd have to say, what are the, what are the path, what's the path forward? <laughs> so if we say we want to hit the pause button, go out into the fall, we'd have to, one of the things like, is that an, a true option for us? If so, it might say, okay, MBLC has to say yes to this. So we, we list all the things that we have to get yeses to in order to do that. If we say we need to redo, you know, redesign things, what are all the things that have to happen for that to be allowed to happen? So it's, it's sort of putting a matrix together about potential paths and, and then it's going to be risk management. Like what are, what's the likelihood for success along each one of those paths? Thank you. Far did that help? Are you good? Thank you. Uh, Pam, Pam Rooney. Seems like all the new members of the committee are the ones with the questions because we haven't lived it long enough uh, like you all have. Um, so I thought I heard someone say that the sub bids came in reasonably close to expectation. Um, so that to me says that the general contractor marking things up in a manner that is unexpected. Um, you all went through a pretty significant value engineering process already back at the beginning of the project or all through the project. <coughs> so if, um, if someone were to tell us um, what components of the building, it's typically the amount of square footage and the HVAC is just the big, the big numbers. And there's not a whole lot of opportunity to pare those big numbers down too much. What would we expect the design team to have to do to rejigger the, the project to, 
to the point where it was significantly um, doubly valued and enge value engineered to the point that it actually shaved off expected costs. <coughs> um, Ellen, do you want to speak to that? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I noted, we we were very surprised it came in seven million dollars because it's we don't have seven million dollars to take out. We have there may there's some wiggle room in there. We we're trying to put our heads together, working with colliers and our estimators. What can we do? So we know we can't reduce square footage. So we're still working on that. Um, so I, I think you know we just don't know that yet. And I you know I'm convinced from my years of experience and just hearing from estimators and the contractor today, it's the lack of competition. And would, would we be a million over? Maybe, um, but not seven. So I don't, honestly, I don't think we can cut $7 million out of this project and have a project anymore. I don't know if that answers your question. Anything else that anybody mm -hmm. wants to ask? Yeah, Pam. So a different aspect of this is is as the town has to grapple with how it would fund a project. Um, I think the community would look to to the friends and to the trustees to understand the ability of the friends and the trustees to bring money forward, and that is a critical piece because I think I think even. Back early on, I think the friends need to needed to bring in another five million or something like that. So this is significantly up that ante to over fourteen million. What is the what is the capacity of the friends to bring that kind of change change to the project? We're trying to figure that out. So what you said is Pam exactly right. I mean, there's a well, there's already a. Um, um, an aspiration for the capital campaign mm -hmm. and the question and the capital campaign as you know has been enormously successful more than nine million dollars raised the question is uh if we were to take that that goal and then increase it uh could they could, is that a reasonable thing to ask and we're trying to figure that we're trying to figure that out i think um ellen i may be putting words in your mouth but what I've what I've understood is that the presence of a single bid is uh, often associated with a uh, an increase in cost in the in the project. Correct. And, and that, that, I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead. And that's that's what and you know as Austin started in the beginning of the conversation is all estimates are done based on getting five bids. And as you get less bids, your chance of being over budget increases. And this has been studied by the Corps of Engineers. Um, and that's the basis of design for all estimates. Um, so yeah, if we get more bidders, I'm convinced we're gonna get better price because it just makes sense. I mean, you have we have no competition at the GC level, zero. So again, that's something that we need to figure. We, that's something that we need to figure out. Um, if we go out to if we if we rebid the project, we need to have some level of confidence. I don't know uh, what level of confidence we'll be able to attain. That that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, no one wants to delay the project any more than it has already been delayed. But if we were to come to the conclusion that I think Ellen provided some estimate that if you have a single bid it often results in it in an increase of 20 percent over the estimate well i think we were at 18.6 percent over the estimate or something like that so that was in in retrospect something right ellen that's not all that surprising but it's not surprising and so in deerfield much smaller project they had one bid and that was that happened to be 10 percent 
There was a library that was just been in Swansea, granted, different market. They had four bins. They ranged at the cost of $550 a square foot to $750 a square foot. So we're seeing big ranges as well. So if you took Swansea and they only got that one bid of $750, you know, that would have been a problem. So, it, you know, it's more of bids a healthier competition and generally lower as lower cost. And it may have been uh, something to do with the timing. So we're asking people to bid on a project at the, I guess I'd call it the high season in terms of, of construction. So again, that's part of the calculus of trying to figure out whether or not among the options that Paul Bachman has noted, whether or not a rebid would be a prudent thing to do. Alex? Yeah, I'm, I guess I, I again want to make sure. So I, I, I'm sure like others have about a million questions percolating through my head, but at the same time, I feel like you, you, you're, you're probably already asking all the questions that are percolating in my head. So I don't want to, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I mean, so I'm, I guess I'm trying to gauge how helpful is it to ask tons of questions now versus wait for you to come back with sort of the research that you've done and then ask the questions. Um, which I think makes more sense, but I don't want to miss an opportunity if that should be happening now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would suggest that you send your questions. I really encourage members, if you have questions or suggestions, send them to Sharon, because it's better for us to have those in advance. Maybe there's something we haven't thought of, you know, and, you know, you know people who are in the, in, you know, Christine, you're, you're an engineer, you may know things that we haven't thought of. So uh, anybody, and Pam, you have a lot of experience at UMass. So if you're thinking, Oh, have you thought about this or that? Please send them to us. We're there's no there's no pride of ownership on this project. Okay, thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, just a follow up question on what Ellen was saying. Um, I what is the square footage on this bid for this project? It's six eighty one, Justine. Six eighty three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, any other questions at this point? Mm. All right. Well, again, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to our colleagues at Hollyers. And uh, one more second, Pam, and at FAA for the work that you've already done and work that you will continue to do. Pam. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I just lost my thought. Right, take your time. <laughs> You know, I'm listening to what you're saying to somebody else. Um, I wrote it down even. Hold on. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, are there going to be, is, is this committee a little along the line of Alex's question? Is this committee um, going to be expected to review invoices that come through from now on? Um, I know, I know I was, looking for a meeting sometime between January and now. And I understand a lot of work has been done. A lot of invoices have been paid. And I thought this com this committee was the one that was supposed to review that. So was concerned that it hadn't been. Jennifer. No disappearing, Techn Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, we have paid a handful of invoices um, without group approval. Um, it's always best practice to have yeah. the, the group approval, but not required for us to keep paying people as they're working. Thanks. I have one, one last question. Um, in terms of design fees, so we are we are now in um, sort of a limbo. Um, did the did the architectural and OPM fees um, are they based on this phase of the project through bids? Are there going to be additional services from here on out as we refigure the whole project? Is that an additional service for the architects? And it does. I'm just going to say it. It does concern me because there were so many there were so many addenda and and the delays in the project. I think were significant and may have played a role in in some of the results that we saw so 
Yeah, go ahead, Paul. So I think that's a good question, uh, Pam. And we have not had that conversation at this point in time, but with the with either of our contractors. Can I just address the addendum thing? Yes. Or do you mind? So if there were 24 addenda, right? There were 10 of those were architectural related. 14 were procedural, meaning, and four of those were extending the bids. Of that, of the, the what's happened, Pam, and I, I think you've been in this business a little while, and years ago you would bundle up the addenda to be, maybe you'd have six, but you'd bundle them up. And what, because of this process with bid docs, every time they got a piece of paper, they made it an addendum. So it, it, it increased the number of that you would typically see. We just did a school in Rhode Island, a sizable school, Gladstone, and they had 10 addenda. Um, so uh, I, the thing that the most, the substance in the addendum were minor. The, the, from the get-go, we only had one GC, one. So we never had competition in the GC. In the file sub-bids, we got one to two bids, maybe three per trade. And those came in on or under our budget. So I, I just wanted, I don't, and it may be me because I'm talking as an architect, I don't think the addenda drove the cost. Because if it did, it would have drove the filed sub-bid cost as well. And it, it didn't have an impact. So I, we can have that healthy debate, but I it just I just wanted to put it out there because people seem to think that was an impact. It, it, we never had another GC, it appears, interested from day one. Well, um, just to, to expound upon the addenda, I, I would agree, Ellen, there was a lot of addenda that, you know, either extending the bid or um, notifying the general contractor that they needed to carry an allowance for um, the elevator filed sub bid that elevator elevator companies, they do not submit filed sub bids. It happens on every single project. It's a problem. Um, so there are there's a certain amount of um, of addenda that did go out. We were just trying to remind people to submit the proper certificate certifications for the Buy America Build America Act. But yet that became yet another addenda, even though the documentation was already in the documents. It was always there, but it, it becomes yet another addenda. So I think that can be misleading and and to um, uh, it, it, it's further investigation, I think, would show that um, that that isn't, um, as Ellen said, really a, a big driver of cost. Um, certainly not to the point where that it would have. I'd say the bigger driver, because we have spoken to some of the general contractors, um, was timing. You know, there was other projects that um, this one got delayed, and so they went moved on to something else and and found something either closer to home or they were awarded a bid that they were going after and then stopped bidding. Another uh, general contractor was approaching their uh, limit for um, uh, aggregate limit for work that they're allowed to take on. So there's a number of different uh, opportunities. We pre-qualified six general contractors. Um, sometimes people pre-qualify to keep their options option open and don't necessarily intend to bid. So we would not have expected, I would be shocked and amazed if we pre-qualified six, uh, six general contractors and actually received six bids. That just would be very, very unusual. So if we were to get three to four bids, I would say we were doing great. If we were getting two, that might be, two to three would be maybe typical. We only got one, which is, which is unfortunate and unusual. But um, I think there's a lot of... Um, you know, we're trying to look for answers and and people are kind of pointing out things quickly. And I think it's going to take some time to really review this and, and be able to come to you with some additional information. Great. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Any other questions at this point? All right. Thank you, Paul. Jennifer, financial update.
Um, financial update, we haven't had any recent donations made, so we're still at the 1.6 million. Um, and we only have the one MBLC um, deposit, so nothing current. Could you remind us how much we have from MBLC? Um, 2.7 million and interest through the end of April on that money is $114,000. Okay. Any questions for Jennifer? Okay. So, Tim, Collier's project updates. Do you have any other updates that we haven't touched on? No, I, I think we've covered it. Um, you know, I, I agree um, with Paul's um, breakdown of the options. Um, I just would point out that um, the, the June 10th um, date that Paul was referring to is really to either accept or reject um, the GC bid. So certainly you could reject the GC bid and then still weigh options about rebidding without changes or rebidding with changes further down the road. But um, as you said, there'll be probably a combination of these options um, as we move forward. Great. Okay, uh, there's no, oh, Pam. Sorry, um, just thinking about the, the financial status. Um, if, if for some reason we had to cancel the project, do we have to give back the 2.7 or whatever that 2.7 to the MBLC? Because it seems to me that it's, it's a complete project. It was taken to a certain point. It was done, you know, by, by, the right procedure it just didn't work for instance um are they are they has anyone asked is is there um the ability for them to um forgive the the repayment because it was all done in expectation of moving forward just going to ask the question paul i think their expectation is that uh, we would pay them back has anyone asked them otherwise we're too, I think we're too early in the process. We don't even know, you know, to even have that conversation. Okay. Tim, do you have any uh, invoices that you want us to review? Tim? Yeah, so there are two in, there are a couple invoices. Um, uh, let me just pull up. Let's see if I can share my screen. So screen sharing's been disabled. If um... Sharon, can you? Uh... If not, I I can just speak to it. Basically, there's an invoice from um, Feingold Alexander for their typical um, <laughs> monthly services. Um, this one is in the amount of thirty two thousand seven hundred dollars. Um, it's dated March 31st of 2024. Um, and this is for, um, services through, um, through March 31st of, of, uh, 2024. Um, the other invoice from Feingold Alexander is in the amount of, $46,238.50. Um, and this is for um, a number of subconsultants um, and um, various work done by those um, subconsultants also through March of uh, March 31st of 2024. Um, this one is also dated March 31st, 2024. Um, and then the third invoice that we have to bring forward tonight is um, a Collier's invoice um, for through work through March 31st, 2024. It's in the amount of $10,978. Um, and that's our typical uh, monthly billing rate um, um, at that amount per month. Okay, and the screen share didn't work. 
Um, I stopped trying, but let me try it again. Okay, now I can share, so let me get those up. Great, thank you, Tim. So here's the Collier's invoice. Um, again, March 31st. Yep. In the amount of 10978. Um, and for the record, it's uh, invoice number 935197. The Feingold Alexander for um, their standard services um, through bidding um, of 32700. And their invoice um, uh, for the subconsultants uh, for the various components, um, various costs that amounts to 46238 and 50 cents. Can you go to the top of that invoice, Tim? Sure. Okay, the, these are these are all for this invoice is all for consultants. Is that right, FAA? I do believe, Austin, that these are all consultants, that this invoice is all consultants. So just uh, just a question. There are check marks uh, next to some of them, and some of them there are no check marks. Is that of any significance? Those aren't ours. I think it's Collier's. Yeah, so. that might be you, Tim. I'm not. I, okay. Those check marks are not from me. <laughs> Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure as Will went through these, but they appear to be next to the various costs. Or the different ones where they're not check marks are the zero dollar ones where there was no billing at that for this period. There's one of a twelve hundred and forty eight dollars and fifty cents that doesn't have a check mark. Nick, oh, I see. It's, yeah, it's, it's further down. down. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, questions about any of these invoices? Just to confirm that Bob and Jennifer have looked at these. Can you confirm that? That is correct. Um, Collier's reviews the invoices. I do a second level of review once we receive them and, and pass on my comments to Jennifer. Thank okay. you. Okay, Pam. Thank you. So just to confirm, these are these are for services on a monthly basis. This is not tied to uh, a contract phase or design, um, you know, a, a project phase. Tim? Uh, well, certainly, um, this is, uh, Collier's is, is, this would be our typical last month for billing for the, for the bidding phase. Okay, so just the fact that the, the whole bid was set off another month, were there, is there another month of additional fees, or did the, did that, that, the fee for that phase get truncated, get cut off at the at the, at the well, as as Paul indicated, it's not conversations we've had yet, um, but we will be having conversations about that. So, and I'm sure that um, um, you know the design team, depending upon what is asked of them, there would be some additional fees as well. Pam, did that answer your question? Uh, no, not really. It didn't. It didn't tell me that if if. For instance, Collier's is being paid um, for their contract through the through the bid date, or is it through the um, negotiation of that of the bid and beginning of construction? So, is it by is it by phase or is it by time on the job? Because the time on the job could be extended, and we continue right. to pay services. Tim. Yeah, so um, we gave uh, our proposal, original proposal, basically had a timeline associated with it and, and identified um, the different phases. And so bidding was a, a, a phase that was uh, with a title and it had a defined timeline to it. And this Pam, from ahead. us, just, uh, sorry, Austin, from us. No, go ahead. We, are, we were only uh, authorized through bid between the end of March and now, it's 
we we have an invoice we haven't had that discussion but um we haven't been a you know as you would expect we haven't been uh, approved to go into construction administration so we just have to have that conversation because the our, our march billing was through 100 percent ca uh, i'm sorry 100 percent bid Okay, any other questions about the invoices? Okay, on the question of approving the invoices, I'm gonna ask you to indicate, um, yes, you let's support uh, approving the invoices, no, you don't. Pam? Yes. Clara? Yes. Christine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Sharon? Yes. George Hicks? Yes. Paul Bockelman. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. And Austin Sarrett says yes. Thank you. If you take down the screen share, that would be great. Sure. Oh, I couldn't find the button. That's okay. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Uh, I don't believe I've received any correspondence under number six. I don't think there's any correspondence. Topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. No topics. Um, item number eight on the agenda is public comment. We have um, 18 attendees. If you would uh, indicate your interested in speaking by raising your virtual hand. Uh, Jeff Lee. Yeah, thank you. This is Jeff Lee from South Amherst. A um, couple things. I would question the claim that the addenda were not substantial. Um, I counted up the pages in the 24 addenda. There were over 1,100 pages. Some were entire sections and drawings being replaced. Um, and also some came in quite late. There were four submitted the very last week of bidding. So I think it very well could have had an effect on the high bid. Um, and outside of question, um, are you considering the effect of uh, continuing this project and um, trying to get Fontaine Brothers to uh, agree to it? That might affect the uh, elementary school project. I think Fontaine Brothers has also expressed interest in that project and uh, I don't know, maybe they can do two projects, but it would, if they can't, it would reduce the competition for the elementary school bit, uh, contractors. So uh, just wanted to raise that point. Thank you. Uh, Austin, muted, you're Austin. muted. Any other member of the public wish to speak if you would raise your virtual hand? Yes, Maria. Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. So this was a pretty incredible meeting. You have still failed to address why you didn't meet since January. You failed to address why any of these invoices could have been discussed and voted on in the four months in intervening. You failed to address why this is going over the bid contracted amount um, for these payments. The fact that you are, it's 10 days past when you've got the bid and you're gonna think about how to manufacture $7 million over the next month. This is ridiculous. You said yourselves, you talked about it. You got, you got an extra year to do all this changing and, and let's take it to bid and let's see what happens. And then you said yourselves, if we don't have, if we don't have it by then, if the bids come in high, we're going to go to something else. You said that. This committee, the people on this committee said that. It's shocking. The only thing that's shocking here, it wasn't the high bids. It's shocking that this committee, and I hope not other committees, 
are going to continue to not look at reality. It's time to move on. This is the town's money. This is your this is the town that's going to be on the hook for this. And if anybody has any faith whatsoever in anything you come up with from this point on, I mean, that's just nuts. That's all I gotta say. Thank you, Maria. Okay, any other member of the public wish to speak? Yes, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you, Austin. Uh, Paul, you laid out five areas of further exploration that you're going to do, and I think there is a sixth. And it shouldn't surprise to hear to have you hear me say this because there are many of us who have talked about another option and have been concerned for a long time that this bid was going to be overpriced. It shouldn't surprise you. It didn't surprise us. The other option is not to tear down the 30-year-old addition, and to look to repair and renovation of the existing structure. And I say that for a couple of reasons. For one thing, there is the POP proposal that you have in your file. It is way out of date, I'm sure. But it was a proposal there for repair and renovation of the existing building. But since this project was conceived, we've been through a very interesting <laughs> and very awkward, awkward, awful period of time, and that's the COVID-19 problem, which taught so many of us, including librarians, and my daughter is one, a librarian, a Hampshire College graduate who is a librarian now. It's taught us that there are other ways of receiving, storing, and accessing information than coming directly into a library, and that is electronically. And you've been through this, I know, because we've been able to access some of your uh, materials electronically. Furthermore, this is a library, a main library, in, in a university and college town in which there are three very large and very well attended libraries available to very many of the residents of the town who are affiliated with the University Amherst and Hampshire Colleges. So it's not a normal town when it comes to libraries. And when you count up the residents, so many of them are already affiliated with institutions where they spend their time in institutional libraries, not the, the, this wonderful library in the middle of town. I'm one who uses the library in the middle of town, even though I'm interested in the other institutions. So what I would suggest, Paul, and I know it's gonna be hard to do, and I know you don't have the time to do it completely, is to consider a project that is not one in which you tear down this the 30 year old edition, but one in which you, you go to the neglected repairs and renovations that you should have been performing over the years, but have put off because you were expecting to totally renovate this library, make those repairs and, and, and project them. Now, let me just talk for a second, and I'm sorry, Austin, if I'm taking too much time, please forgive me, but let me just talk about budget for a minute. For one thing, in my experience, donors are giving to projects they believe in and if they believe in this library, and if you come forward with a new plan, you're going to keep those donations that you expect to receive. The donors aren't going to walk away. They want what's best for the town, what's best for the library, what you consider best for the library, and, and they will see it. I mean, we saw what a wonderful do a, a donation came forward with the North Amherst Library. There will be others like that for this library when you have the right project and are able to go forward. The other thing is, yes, you will not get the MBLC money that's now on the table, but it may be possible with your legislative assistance, leg assistance of the local legislators to get state money anyway. There are options that are open, that may be open to you that you haven't been able to consider because you're not thinking about a repair and renovation. You're thinking about the project that you have on the table. I, I know this is going to be a very hard process to reconsider, but the time has come to do that. Because, Paul, there is this additional way forward that's possible. I don't think you can, you're not going to have the answer by, by, by June, I suspect, because you're going to be working very hard on this bid. But I think all is not lost. This can be a, 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 re, a, a, a renovated library that you and we can all be proud of if you will only think that way. Austin, thank you very much for giving me all this extra time. I appreciate very much your 
courtesy and letting me speak. Thank you. Th thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyone else wish to speak? Uh, Maria Kopicki, your hand is up. Do you want to speak again? Or okay. Thank you so much. Any other member of the public wish to speak? Okay. So I want to thank you for the work that you did today. Um, we will reconvene this committee uh, in a timely way as soon as we have some more information to share with you. Uh, so at this point, I don't think we can schedule a meeting because we don't know when we'll have that information to share. But we will, as soon as we are clear that we do have some information to share that will be helpful in informing all of us, we will reconvene the uh, committee and expect to do it in a way that's uh, timely well in advance of when the town manager needs to make of the June 10th decision. Okay, everybody, again, thank you so much. Everybody stay well. Meeting, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye.